obviously, uh, yep, we're we're a dairy farm here um, at Tokal. Obviously, the farm is does also have a beef enterprise and horses and sheep. But I'll I'll speak today about the the dairy, which is a section that I manage. So so the dairy um, has around about two hundred and sixty hectares that we use on the Tokal property. Um, and that that includes blocks that are that are away from the main platform or the main area here where we milk the cows. On this uh, milking uh, platform, I think Joe might be sharing that screen with you now. Um, you can you might be able to see. Um, could they see that now or not? Yep, they should be able yep. to see the map. Farm yep. map yep. the farm map. So we have uh, all the. Uh, Paddocks are outlined in the in the green there. That's that's our milking area here at Tokal Dairy. Now that that's about 130 hectares on that on that section there. So um, on that section there, we milk around about 280 to 300 cows all year round, and it is a pasture-based system. So so that means that ideally every day we like to be able to graze cattle on that pasture. Um, does that happen every day of the year, a three, you know, all, all year round? No, it doesn't. Sometimes we run short of feed. So in our dairy system, we also have a, a, a very well-managed pasture conservation system where we will conserve pasture grown in, in that area and also other areas on the farm. So we might talk a little bit more about that a bit later on. Um, yeah, so that, that, that um, section there, we have... Uh, around about 70 hectares of that can be irrigated on this, uh, what we'll call our milking platform. And, um, you know, 60 to 70 hectares is dry land. That means we, we don't have any, any irrigation capabilities on, on that land. So um, what's the difference there? Well, at the moment, there's no difference because we've had um, extremely good rainfall this year after suffering nearly three years of um, you know, drought conditions off and on and, and, and ending, uh, you know, last summer just passed in, in really, really bad drought conditions, which I suppose I saw the schools from Gunnar there a little while ago, weren't they? So they'd know all about uh, drought conditions. Uh, the further west you go, the, the worst it was. So, um, yeah, certainly we, we had a really bad summer and um, our irrigation was the thing that... Um, that really kept us going. We were, we were able to graze uh, cows and graze pasture under that, that irrigation throughout the summer. But our dry land country really was, yeah, th there was really very minimal pasture growing on that. So, so irrigation really uh, is key to this whole enterprise in, in most years. At, at the moment, like this year, we've already had um, you know, since January, about 760 millimetres of rain. So when the drought broke here, we've, we've, we've well and truly, in this six-month period, gone very close to what hitting what would be our annual average rainfall. So um, we expect to be above average, you know, for the rest of this year as well. Um, and irrigation the last few months really hasn't played a very critical role at all. We've, we've been, yeah growing all our pasture from the rain that, that has, uh, has fallen. So that's, that's really been a, a great benefit to us. It's, it's filled our water storages back up, filled our farm dams back up, um, our irrigation dam up the top of the Patterson River here. It's, it's at 100% capacity now. It's actually overflowing or, you know, can, they're releasing water every day out of it. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're really in a good position as far as water and pasture goes at the moment. Um, I think Joe might be able to share some shots of the pasture around the farm at the moment. Um, and just to show you what we, what we have growing here, and that'll lead into, you know, what, what, I, what we do here for as far as our annual, you know, calendar of operations and, and the, the types of pasture that we plant or types, types of pasture that we sow every year. So they can see that one on the screen now, Joe, can they? Yep. That's that. So that there, you might know people who are a bit um, keen on pasture. We've, we've got some lucerne and ryegrass in that pasture mix. Um, and that's recently just been cut for silage. So we, we do grow ryegrass here. Or we sow ryegrass every autumn in nearly all of our uh, dairy platform in all of that 130 hectares. Um, and this, this happened to be an old lucerne bed. 
um, here. So we've just, uh, this autumn recently, just drilled the, the ryegrass into it, just to thicken that pasture up, like the, the cuts of silage that we were getting off it, the, the amount of dry matter per hectare was, yeah, was, was starting to get a bit low. And we, we topped it up with that ryegrass just to really uh, boost up number one, like the volume, but also the quality. It's great quality. That's a beautiful mix of pasture when we have that ryegrass and, and loose and mix there together. So really provides us with, um, you know, that optimum amount of um, a protein and energy that our cows require. So I suppose that, that really leads us to, uh, you know, what sort of pastures we do so on the farm here. Um, I think Joe's sharing a, another shot there at the moment. That there is is what we you know describe as an annual crop. That's actually a leafy turnip variety of brassica, um, and some oats in amongst it. So that pasture we sow that as a as a grazing pasture um, in very early autumn. It can actually nearly even be sown right at the end of summer. We have had some success sowing it very late February in in some years, depending on how hot the summer is. But this stuff here that you can see was actually sown the first week in March. And we've had that um, oats and brassica um, being able to be grazed all the way right up until now. So that, you know, we, we sowed it in early March. We, we had the first grazing in, in about mid-April. And uh, what is it now? Nearly August and we're still grazing it. So it's been a tremendous year uh, for that, that oats and brassica mix here. Um, we... We don't do that over the whole farm. Um, if, if you look back to that farm map, you might see some blue circles that, that are there. And that's our centre pivot irrigation country. We might be able to share that screen again. Um, and that centre pivot um, country is, is what we, we know is going to be very secure, very reliable. We, we know that we're never going to run out of moisture there. We, we are very lucky that, that this... Uh, can I see that at the moment? Yep. yep, yep. So we're really lucky that the water source that we have, the Patterson River, we've never ever uh, run out of water. Our allocation is, is good. We've got nearly an 800 megalitre allocation out of that river. And even in the dry times, we, uh, we've never been put on restrictions because um, we happen to be in a very unique spot, which uh, being on the coast here, we're, we're in the tidal pool of the river. So... We can at times, uh, the, the tide does influence the, the height of the river here, but it, uh, um, we've never really had a problem with, with the salt coming back up into the river, but it's certainly something that we do monitor in the very dry times. We're a little bit worried at the end of last summer, the salt levels did creep up a little bit, um, but not, not enough to cause us to stop irrigating. So um, yeah, we're very lucky in that that sense that I know that if I sow that 40 hectares under those center pivots where you can see the, the blue circles there, um, I can basically sow a pasture that I know I can look after and, and can last all, all year round or very close to all year round. So what we do in that uh, circumstance is uh, the center pivot country, we still have that as a, um, what you call a Kaikuya base. So there is Kaikuya as a, um, an ongoing, uh, you know, naturalised pasture that's that's sort of throughout that area, but but every autumn we will sow an Italian rye, um, clover and chicory mix into that pasture. Now we, we would do that um, in March. We'd suppress the kikuya that would be would be growing, and um, we we would then sow that yeah Italian rye. And like you guys might have already studied this, but Italian rye is basically you know, a biannual ryegrass that, that in theory can last perhaps two seasons. But the main reason we sow it is because it's got a very, very long growing window. We can sow it reasonably early um, with the centre pivots, you know, being able to water it. And, um, and then we, we can actually um, graze it, sow it in March, get our first grazing off in about sort of seven weeks time, and then, then graze it all the way up until uh, basically December, you know, very close to Christmas time, mid, mid December. We'll, we'll still actually have good quality ryegrass um, and, and the clovers. We've got some red clover, some chicory in there. And um, so that's really provided us nearly with, with um, nine months worth of, of grazing that, that sort of pasture. 
Now, I see we've got a question there from Gunnedah High. What type of irrigation system do you use? So, yep, under that section that we're just talking about, that's their, their centre pivot irrigators. So that's our best type of irrigation that we have on the farm here. So that's, we've got 40 hectares of centre pivot irrigation. On the, I said at the start, we have about 70 hectares that we can irrigate on the dairy. The, um, the other 30 hectares is travelling boom irrigators. We have, well, we have two, two travelling boom irrigators with a, with a soft hose. We have one um, hard hose irrigator, one, one uh, that has a, a large boom of water as well. Um, and then we also have two lower pressure um, uh, travelling irrigators as well that, that, that do irrigate a couple of other sections. So they're okay. Like they certainly uh, certainly uh, do do the job, job for us, but the centre pivots are hands down. That's been a game changer for us since we've, we've put those centre pivots in. They've only been in for about three years. Um, and before that, we actually had a system in there called bike shift irrigation, where throughout that 40 hectares, we had a, a, grid, a grid pattern of about 160 little individual sprinklers that you actually had to go and move. You, you, it's called bike shift because the idea was you'd take the quad bike around and move these, uh, actually might not, might have been 120 sprinklers, I can't remember quite quite the number. I've tr tried to forget that time. Um, I mean, you had to move those all around a, a grid pattern by hand. And yeah, look, we, we have found that basically we've nearly, in the dry weather, when, when it was really bad, that bike shift irrigation just could not uh, keep up to to the water requirements of the pasture. So we'd have pasture dying, we'd have brown spots, we'd have it wind affected, it would miss spots, the, the grid wouldn't be even. So in, in those real uh, drought conditions, we've gone very close to doubling, if not tripling the amount of dry matter or, you know, production of grass, production of pasture that we've been able to grow under those centre pivots. So yeah, they've been a huge a huge benefit to us and um, not to mention the uh, you know reduction in in labor um, we, we basically you know I, I can start them now from my phone if I want to we've got that all uh, the technology there that uh, just push the button and and um, and allocate the amount you know that it goes that, that's going to go on so I can get 12 mils of, of irrigation over that uh, 40 hectares in 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 a day and I can do that every day, seven days a week, if, if I need to. Like, we don't really have to do that unless it's ex extreme, extremely hot and we've got a lot of evapotranspiration. Okay, we've got one more question here. Dungog High would like to know, uh, do, you, do you also use any bore water for irrigation? No, uh, we don't. Here at Tokyo, we're, all our irrigation is from the Patterson River. But yeah, certainly that's a good question. There'd be a lot of dairy farms that, that would especially up the Hunter Valley, which is not far from us. Uh, yeah, that's very common uh, up in, in, in the Hunter Valley that they would use bore water for irrigation. But no, ours is, is all out of the Patterson River. And like I say, that, that for us is, is such a brilliant resource that we've, yeah, we've never, never ran out of water. So that's, you know, in a country like ours, that's actually a pretty rare thing. And, and we know we're very lucky to, to be in a situation like that. Um, yeah, so I suppose back to the general management of the pastures, like I say, under that 40 hectares there, we, we grow that uh, under the 40 hectares of centre pivot irrigation, we grow that Italian ryegrass, clover, chicory mix. Um, we, we do sow it every year, even though I said a minute ago that the Italian rye could be seen as a biannual ryegrass that, that may come back again the next season. We uh, we, we, we actually do sell it every year. So which one do you want to show the, yep. 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 So this is just a picture of some ryegrass there now that Joe took these uh, just yesterday, actually. And that's a paddock there that's about ready to be grazed. So how we manage the pasture is basically um, we, we try to set a grazing uh, rotation length. That means that every 21 to 28 days, depending on seasonal factors, like the time of the year, we, we can be back around grazing that same bit of pasture. Um, you know, the pasture that we ate today, we'll, we'll be back, uh, back there again in around about, or at the moment, it's, it's about 22 days, and we'll be back eating that same sort of pasture. 
So that shows you there, that's ryegrass um, at about the three leaf stage, around about, you know, probably 22, 2300 kilograms up to 2500 kilograms of uh, dry matter to the hectare at the moment. Ideal stuff like that, that's just like rocket fuel for dairy cows. Um, they love it and uh, that's, we, we get a tremendous amount of milk production out of that sort of feed. So at the moment, our herd is, is averaging 30 litres per cow per day. So that's across the whole herd. Um, our top cow, we just heard record, and our top cow did about 53 litres uh, for the day. So that's the sort of milk that you can expect, you know, if you can grow that sort of pasture and provide that sort of nutrition to your cows, that's the that's the sort of production that they'll give you. Obviously, a lot of other stuff, background stuff that goes into that as well as far as, um, and Mike will probably speak about that tomorrow with, you know, breeding your cows and having the sort of cows that, that are capable of that sort of production and, you know, other health treatments and all that sort of stuff you've got to, you know, give them. But, but our cows at the moment, yeah, are responding to that sort of nutrition by, yeah, rewarding us with, with that sort of production. So, that, that really, you know, we're extremely pleased with that. Um, that's hit every target that we could have hoped for this season. Um, and yeah, probably, or well not probably, it, it is actually our best winter uh, that, that we've, we've ever had here on, on Tokal. So, um, yep, there's a bit of management goes into that for sure. But um, We've also been yeah, very, very fortunate with the season that, that we've had. So we, we certainly don't take that for granted one little bit after, the, after what we've been through the last few seasons. Um, now, the rest of the farm, uh, we, the, what we call our, you know, our, our dry land country, we, this year, like I say, there's been very little difference. We're still seeing that sort of pasture in the dry land country. The change that I would make, and we do make there, is we, we don't plant that Italian type ryegrass. We plant just what, what you'd describe as an, an annual ryegrass there, which number one's a little bit cheaper seed, like to, to buy the seed. Um, you sort of uh, can be prepared to take the hit if the, if the season doesn't turn out as well as you would have hoped. And, and you don't get, you know, you may lose a paddock just from, you know, extreme dry weather sometimes. Um, but you uh, probably also the annual ryegrass, a little bit tougher, can handle that, um, you know, that tougher sort of uh, seasonal condition. Um, so, yeah, we, we tend to sow our dry land pastures with that annual ryegrass for those couple of reasons. Yeah, a little bit, little bit cheaper to put in and, and probably a little bit tougher. And it doesn't last quite as long into the season, uh, but that's okay. By that time, the, the Kaikuya base is actually coming back and that, that's a summer growing species. So that, that would start to grow, you know, from, uh, you know, about mid spring onwards anyway. So that's when that ryegrass would, would end. So yeah, that's the idea is that over the entirety of that 130 to 140 hectares on our milking cow platform, we do have um, pasture, be it a, a warm season grower or a cool season grower all year round. Um, very, um, it's very rare that under that centre pivot country, especially, we don't actually cultivate um, very much under there at all. That's all direct drilled. Um, in so that you know, like every every March, uh, that summer species would have been growing up until then throughout the summer. That Kaikuya base pasture, we we go in and then just probably graze it down fairly hard. We would use a, a, a very light rate of Roundup quite often just to suppress the Kai Q. We don't actually want to kill it out. Um, it might only be a couple of hundred uh, mil, mils, millilitres to the hectare, um, just to slow it down enough to allow our ryegrass to establish. Um, and then we'd be back, hopefully then grazing that again, like I say, that first grazing of ryegrass in, in sort of seven weeks. So really our production of pasture under those centre pivots never really stops. We had that little bit of a longer break there when we were establishing our, our winter or our, our cooler growing um, species. Um, but really, yep, it's, it's grazing there all year round. And very similar, if the, um, if the dry land's going well with moisture, it's a very similar program. If it's not going well, like, like I say, last summer, we were down to, to no pasture being grazed off those areas. So yep, that does, does depend. Um, so yeah, uh, probably one paddock under those pivots that we, we would cultivate, like do a full cultivation, uh, paddock number seven, um, you, you 
might not see the paddock numbers there, but it just goes one to seven from the dairy. And um, that's got some soil there that's suitable for cultivation. The rest of that soil under the pivots is, is basically on, uh, you know, uh, it's a shallower soil on some, some ridge country that um, is still quite fertile, but certainly not suitable for cultivation. If, if we look on our farm map, we do have um, really only two alluvial flats on that 130 hectares. And that's um, down there at uh, Pethbridge and Moller. I think Joe's bringing up to show you those alluvial. Uh, that's the yeah, that's the soils map there now. So it's a very deep soil. Yeah, really a great soil, suitable for cultivation. Like, and, and it does well with a full cultivation. Um, no, no, um, yeah, good flat country as well. So we, we, we don't have any, any real risk of erosion or anything like that. And um, we will actually sow those paddocks uh, down there to, to uh, or we'll crop those paddocks at times. So we've, we've grown things like maize down there uh, with the full cultivation, uh, forage sorghum as well. Uh, there, there are a couple of summer crops that we, we, we can grow down there. And also lucerne is something that does really well in that sort of country. So we're actually going to sow lucerne both in... Um, We've got it um, in, in um, Windmill Paddock, which is a photo you saw a minute ago. Just click on the one next to it there, Joe. That'll bring up, no, no, just go forward a little bit and that'll bring up Windmill. There you go. Yeah, Windmill Paddock, it's, it's, it's the one that has loosened in at the moment that you just saw a photo of. But if we go back to the dairy uh, milking area, uh, Pethbridge and Moller, they will, um, they will both have loosened sewn into them this uh, this spring actually. So we're just about to, we'll probably do that in uh, in the next sort of three to four weeks. Um, yeah, so that, that gives you an idea over our, our, our farm on, on that section there. Yeah, generally ryegrass, ryegrass is really uh, key for us, um, but certainly through the, the warmer months, the summer months, we do have that Kaikuya, Kaikuya base. Now the idea for us is I said at the start, uh, can we, can we, uh, do we have enough pasture to graze every day of the year or year round? And the answer is no, you always run into gaps, especially with drought and things like that, or that, that, that little window at you know, early autumn when we've got a lot of paddocks taken out where we, we've just sown them. And, you know, like I say, it might only be seven weeks till first grazing, but, you know, we could have had a couple of weeks paddock preparation time in there as well. So that couldn't really leave us with a 10 week gap in some paddocks before the cows are actually back on there. So, so, you know, would your cows want to just stop eating for 10 weeks? No, they don't particularly like that. Um, so what we do is we, we make sure we have enough forage conserved for them. And we've got silage bunkers. You might be able to open that up there, Joe. And you can see there, there's some pits. So we've got four silage pits dug into the ground there. They've got a concrete floor on them that, that yeah, in the times of excess, uh, we, we will actually fill those up with, uh, yeah, with fodder. So that could be ryegrass, could be corn silage, could be forage sorghum. Uh, and we, we basically roll those, you know, chop them off the paddocks, roll them down in the pit, squash all the air out of them and then cover them with plastic. And that's how we conserve our silage. So they're full at the moment. Uh, at the moment, we've got some left. We've got a little bit of maize silage left in, in one of our pits at the moment um, that was left over from, from the summer just gone. But no, we're really, because of these three years of drought conditions we've had, our, our cupboards are fairly bare. So we're, um, we're looking all, all, um, all go this spring to try and, conserve as much as we can and, and we've been lucky enough this winter that, that we've actually already conserved about 200 round bales it's not actually in those pits we do make round bale silage as well and um, it's quite unbelievable um, yeah there's a there you go that's yep there's some round bales behind the shed there that I think you can see on your screen now um, yeah we've we've been fortunate enough and, and probably through um, some good management as well hopefully that that we've um, we've conserved 200 round bales already um, this winter, which is really uh, for us is a great start. Um, spring, spring is really the time where we would make a lot of our ryegrass silage. Um, but yeah, we're, we're already 200 bales into it and spring hasn't started yet. So if it keeps going like this and, and it doesn't turn too dry for us, uh, we will be able to conserve a lot more. Our problem is with the irrigation that we have when it does get dry, um, 
we we sort of don't have enough irrigation on all our country that we have um, to, to keep the feed growing at optimum levels. So uh, plans for the future, certainly we, we, we are looking to invest in another centre pivot. Uh, we are looking, uh, you know, at even a lateral move irrigator so we can irrigate some more, um, you know, of our country on the milking platform, but also, you know, I said at the start, we've got about 260 hectares. So we've got nearly this much country, again, away from the farm on, on blocks. We've got a block at uh, Bonavista and a block, block at New Morella where we can, uh, we can grow feed. Um, and, and the Bonavista block is one that's, yeah, we, we do have, uh, do have um, irrigation there and we'd love to improve that a bit more. We certainly uh, could grow a lot more feed up there in the future with an improved irrigation system. So, so there's some plans for the future. Um, yeah, look, uh, some, just looking at some other questions that you, that you had here on, on your list. Um, yeah, problems associated with the, with the production system. Really, like I say, a big problem here can be a lack of rainfall. Uh, there's no doubt about that in, in the dry years. We've, um, yeah, we certainly need to make sure that we have enough conserved feed and that's what we're, what we're aiming to do. We can certainly have pest problems as well. There's no doubt about that. Uh, last year, we had a really bad helicoverpa, helicoverpa, Work, if I can say that word properly, Heliothus caterpillar. <laughs> We've got to say the, the proper word these days. Uh, a caterpillar in the corn uh, that we had to, we actually used a, a spray on that, which was a biological con control and it worked quite well. We had to be pretty careful with that one because there's some fairly strong chemicals that you can use to control that one. But we've actually got a bee enterprise that runs, actually a lot of the beehives are here on the dairy farm. So yeah, we went for the biological control for the for the caterpillar, and yeah, it worked really well. They um, yeah, they basically were taken care of after one spray with that with that biological control. So actually got a big spray rig in to do that for us, a, a spray coop that drives over the top of the crop and and sprayed the whole lot. Um, it, if we hadn't have done that, yeah, we would have actually lost a lot of quality. Um, out of that corn and lost yeah a, a lot of the potential yield as well have we got another question yeah there? it's just about um where the i'll get the map back up yep um, share that they're just asking about which area the, um, the, the you'd new, like to put the new center the new pivot. pivot yeah so the new center pivot would go in out um where you might see the two blue circles that we've already got the next center pivot would go just there like on that next block across the road. So we could actually put, if I can, yep. can they see the mouse if I sort of draw that? It, ooh, yep. That's a bit big. But ideally we try and capture, if you can see what I'm doing with the mouse there, as much of that area as possible with, with one pivot. Now that, that gives us around about a 35 hectare pivot in that area there. So, um, and then what we do for these areas over the back here, we'd, um, we'd actually put in some new hydrants and run some hard hose travelers in, the, in those couple of paddocks, crop north and crop south over there as well. And pro possibly another one along the bottom here where the centre pivot wouldn't quite reach. So yeah, if, if we could put that, you know, 35 hectares there under a centre pivot, you know, we'd be looking at, at doubling our, our dry matter yield off that section of the farm to what we're currently doing now. In, in um, you know, that, that in average terms throughout, you know, good, good and bad years. Like I say, at the moment, not a scrap of difference, um, but do we always get this much rainfall every year, year in, year out? Obviously not. Um, we've we sort of figured that we've had a enough of a bad run the last three years, so we're we're really just making the most out of this um, this high rainfall year at the moment. That in saying that, talking about problems associated with the production system, um, believe it or not, high rainfall can actually be a real problem for us here too. We can get extreme flooding events um we're lucky enough to escape that this year um i think we had i just brought it up there a minute ago um we had in uh in february when the drought broke we had nearly 270 millimeters of rain in in one month in february so that tells you how wet it got but because things were so dry and the catchment was so depleted we actually escaped that without a flood it was very close to a flood but we didn't, we didn't actually, uh, yeah, the water didn't break the banks. So we were, we were quite okay. 
Um, but since then, we've had, um, you know, March was 147 uh, millimetres of rain. So it was quite wet. So in the paddocks and, and talking about our pastures, I've really got to, got to protect those pastures when it gets like that because the cows can really bog up the paddocks, uh, can damage the pasture quite a lot. Um, so we do have a feed pad, a hard stand where we can feed cattle that can serve feed in those times. So that, that sort of links into our, you know, mm. ongoing sustainability. I want to do everything I can to, to uh, protect those pastures, protect those paddocks to make sure that, you know, number one, we, we don't, you know, ruin the quality of the pasture or kill, kill plants. But then also, you know, we could be eroding those paddocks if we start to lose grass cover off them. So really, yeah, there we go. Joe's just brought up the flood risk of the farm. So that shows you a big flood, that blue area, it can all be underwater. And back in 2015, that's exactly where the water was. There's no two ways about that. It, it blew out the railway line just to the west of us. Um, it, it, was, it was quite a devastating flood, that one. In our country up at Bonavista, where I say that, you know, we, we can irrigate in one of the blocks away from the dairy platform here. It was basically a lake and just, just where the house and the sheds are, there's a little hill up there that, that didn't get flooded. So, um, and back on our milking platform, you can see there's a lot of areas, you know, around the dairy and the silage pits were all okay. But yeah, we, we certainly couldn't graze the cows on any of those uh, paddocks that were were in, in that blue zone and that was that was all uh yeah all a lake as well and how long were those pastures out for uh yeah those pastures were affected for for probably nearly a couple of months after that so uh that that sort of shows you in in those extreme wet times you you've nearly got to yeah be able to feed feed your cattle for yeah look the water might only stay there for two or three weeks but then you've got another six weeks after that where uh, that there may be no pasture. And, and depending on the time of the year, you have your flood, if you were to have your flood in the middle of winter, it could even be longer. Um, so yeah, we, we've certainly certainly got to uh, factor that into our thinking and, and that can serve feed for a, for a production system like a dairy where you're feeding cows and, and, and wanting to produce milk all year round, you've got to be able to feed them all year round. So we, we basically you know, focus on our pastures and grazing those pastures directly with the cows. That's, that's number one. But yeah, certainly if we don't have that conserved feed up our sleeve, we're, we're in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah. So yep. Floods and droughts. It's the story of agriculture. And, and even with all the technology we have now with, you know, center pivot irrigation and, and soil moisture probes and apps on phones and, and, and certainly we can predict the weather a lot better now than what we used to, but uh, when that stuff happens, it's, uh, it's still nearly as devastating as, as, um, as ever. Um, so yeah, that's a couple of problems associated with the farm, but yeah, management practices that, that we use uh, to address environmental sustainability. Well, I've already mentioned one where we, we certainly do uh, watch how we graze the paddocks. We always leave a residual of grass cover on the paddocks. We never ever uh, graze them down to bare dirt or anything like that. We have the full rotational grazing system operating all the time. We don't cultivate our, our, our you know, um, ridge country, our uh, very light soils on those, on those ridges. Um, only cultivate the soil that's suitable for cultivation. Everything else is direct drilled. Um, oh, that, that was a photo. Go back to that one, Joe. Actually, that, that's a paddock that we just grazed last night. So, you're lucky enough we had Joe here yesterday who went out in the paddock for us and took some photos around the farm. And that's uh, paddock five that the cows grazed last night. And you can see that they've grazed it out well, but it's certainly not uh, down to bare dirt or anything like that. Now those cows had two paddocks, uh, two nights in that paddock, and now they won't see that paddock again for another uh, probably 22 days. So we graze it down to five centimetre, four to five centimetre residual. Um, and that does a couple of things. Yes, it's great for our environmental sustainability, keeping our soils, uh, you know, healthy and, and not being eroded. But the big production benefit of that is that we also then can um, get that pasture to, to spring back really quickly. Uh, that, that stem is just like a little um, energy reserve for the plant and it shoots up those leaves really quickly. So if we, um, if we manage our pastures like that all the time, we... Uh, we can expect that we can get back on them in that, um, you know, with, with adequate 
moisture and, and the right application of fertilizer, we can get back on them uh, within that 20, uh, you know, 21 to, to 20 sort of eight day rotation, depending on the time of the year. Question about record. Yeah, so Gunnadar, yep. Uh, what records do you keep for pasture production on the farm? And how do you keep them in diaries, computer, etc.? Yeah, so our pasture, at the moment, we're currently trialling a platform called Pasture IO. Um, and that's actually measuring our, oh, we're involved in a trial, but it actually does have a record keeping um, element to the, to the software. So certainly all our records are kept in that. They are still kept in, in the diary as well at the moment. So I so say we're, we're just getting into this, uh, into this platform. Um, so yeah, Pasture.io is the, is the name of that platform. Um, that system is actually uh, going around at the moment and it measures uh, the volume of dry matter on our pastures via satellite. So that's why we're interested in that one, especially we're a trial site um, for that for that uh, pasture management platform, and what we're really doing is we're we're going out measuring um, the pasture grown here on site with um, electronic plate meters and and um, actual dry matter cuts, and we're calibrating that satellite. So that's going to be interesting technology into the future, just to see how accurate we can get the satellite readings. Um, that'll be a great benefit for farmers because. Um, you know, to go around and, and measure your pasture every day, even with an electronic plate meter, is very time consuming. You've got to hook it up to the, you know, to the quad bike or the side by side and, and drag it around paddock to paddock. Um, if you do it by hand, there's things like, you know, rising plate meters that you can do. Or if you uh, actually went to the effort to do a, a, you know, a dry matter cut and actually go out and cut a, a quadrant of pasture and dry it down, all that's extremely time consuming. Um, so yeah, this satellite technology, I think it's certainly something very interesting and keep your eye out for that over the next couple of years. Um, yeah, so I suppose, um, other plans for the future would be, uh, yes, yeah, certainly the irrigation improvement is, is our, is our plan for the future. Um, we want to grow more maize this summer. Um, I said a little while ago, we ensile maize in those, those silage bunkers. We're, we're looking to, to, to probably grow, yeah, potentially 30 to 40 hectares, probably 40 hectares of maize this summer um, and conserve that in those pits. Um, and that'll be certainly a, a step up on, on last year. Um, we're also looking at, yeah, sowing some more loosen this year, probably putting in around about um, yeah, probably 15 hectares of lucin, uh, which, uh, you know, under, under full irrigation, that'll be a, uh, yep, a great benefit for us. Some of that can be directly grazed by the cows. So we will on Pethbridge and Moller paddock on the grazing platform, we'll actually mix a little bit of chicory into that. And that'll be a great help for us over the summer. Uh, we, we may, we may from time to time conserve that into silage, but it'll actually mainly be grazed through the summer to help us that's what we struggle the most actually is uh, grazing cattle in the summertime, trying to get number one, that quality pasture and, uh, and number two, sometimes enough of it if, if the weather's really dry. So um, yeah, probably those, uh, you know, 12 hectares here on, on the grazing platform will be, will be a great addition for us for this summer. Um, yeah, look, plans for the future include technology, obviously all the time. Um, and we've, we've recently uh, put in some moisture probes around the farm and we're looking to this summer or this season to more accurately be able to allocate the amount of water that goes on in each irrigation based on the readings from those probes. So we're using that at the moment, but we're still learning about that, that technology. Um, we've had a few little glitches as you do with all technology, a couple of um, circuit boards decided to die on us and things like that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're going, we're going well with, um, yeah, with that at the moment. And yeah, certainly I think by this summer, we'll have our head around, you know, pretty well, you know, when that moisture probe says, says this amount, we, we give it this amount of water so we can, you know, hopefully nearly perfectly match up the amount of water that we're applying to what that, to what that soil and what that pasture needs. So, so that'll be, that'll be a, you know, a great improvement 
for us. Um, so we we might wrap up. Um, oh, we've got a little bit more time, Meg. Have we? You want, or do we want to go for questions? No, we'll go. For, got a little bit more time. Okay. Yep. Just read that one. Okay. So yep. Um, I suppose I'll just finish off on some technologies in general. Now, tomorrow you'll hear obviously more about our cows and about the herd, but um, the um, yeah, and I, another good point, I've just got some helpers here um, <laughs> about plans for the future. Um, yeah, nearly missed, missed uh, one that we're, that we're really keen on. We're actually looking at the moment at the possibility of putting in a big loafing barn for our entire herd to be, uh, you know, really, it's a, it's a few things. Uh, we, we spoke already about the, the wet weather, those extreme wet events. Um, and the and the hot summers. Look, we we've noticed the climate. Uh, you know, the climate's changing. Summers are getting uh, probably more unpredictable. Definitely hotter. Um, what can we do uh, for our cows? Dairy cows hate the heat. That is the number one thing that affects production and, and the health of your cows, as far as a weather event goes. Um, and, and those extreme weather events as well, are very bad for their production and for their health. So, our idea. Uh, would be a, a, a loafing barn, a big, it's a, a deep litter composting barn, not stalls or anything like that. It's a big open area where the cows are free to mingle and roam around, but they're protected from the elements. Uh, basically, uh, you know, you'd have um, fans in there, the big, big fans with uh, you know, helicopter type blades on them. Um, and the cows on a 45 degree day when we have our extreme summer events here, they could be under that, that loafing barn area and, and the temperatures probably only get into the, the low 30s. So it's not air conditioned, but it's a huge, huge improvement for them. There's a few other farms that have already done that, not too far from us now, and, and the benefits have been huge. So you have that huge animal welfare um, benefit. You know, your cows are so much, so much healthier, um, so much better cared for. But, but like with most things, um, animal welfare and production go hand in hand. So, so really good animal welfare outcomes that equal good production outcomes. And, and we'd be looking, uh, you know, from a system like that, that, that our cows perhaps could, could drop something, you know, in, in the vicinity of, uh, you know, seven litres, eight litres a cow a day from an extreme heat event. Uh, we, we, could, we could potentially not lose that production in the summertime. So that, that'd be certainly something that's, that we're planning for the future. We don't know how that'll go. Um, but yeah, that's, that's another big one. Um, other technologies that you'll hear a bit more about tomorrow, and I'll just briefly touch on them. In the dairy, there's a lot of technology. Uh, you know, everything from our cup removers, we have uh, pneumatic stall gates, we have a, an automatic draft gate uh, where we can draft the cows out. We have, the, every cow in the herd is collared up. Um, and Mike will talk more about this tomorrow, uh, where we can, uh, actually that sends us back information that, that we're able to tell when the cow's on heat. Um, so, so all those will either go to a desktop computer or to my phone. And um, yeah, really our system would, would, uh, would not run near as well if we didn't have that technology in place now. We, we do a, a, every four weeks, we do an ultrasound preg test on our cows to detect when they're, when they're on heat as well. So um, yeah, the technology in the dairy and, and the animal space Really, I think at the moment is is uh, is equally as exciting as as um, you know the, the the pastures and irrigation. I didn't even touch on the uh, GPS controlled uh, you know tractors and all that sort of stuff that we have for for our precision precision sowing technology. Every, every seed that's sown on the farm, uh, the the tractor is GPS guided. Um, so yeah, certainly the technology for us now uh, is. There's no denying it. That that's that's the way of the future, and these things are incrementally going to come in. Everything won't be adopted. Everything won't be useful. Uh, sure, you can have too much data sometimes, but it's about us just making sensible decisions as we go along to to really work out what are the things that that are useful and work best for us, and what data do we need to capture? What's what's going to help us achieve more efficiency, more productivity, and and be better for our overall production of the of the system. So maybe with that, we should wrap up then, Meg, should we? Is that a yes? And then... Um, I, think, and, I think that you've... Yep. Um, thank you so much 
uh, Matt, for that you've given us such a fabulous snapshot and sort of look into um, the amazing practices that you're doing there at Bacow um, Farms. Um, but we might, I am aware of time, so we might actually pass over to the schools. Um, has anyone got some questions? Now's your chance. I've probably missed about a hundred things that you need to know about, so feel free to, to ask me. Yeah, I, uh, I have a question. Um, how do you believe sustainability has or can be achieved on the farm? Yeah, um, so for us, sustainability is really achieved in the pasture sense by um, really looking after our pastures and that rotation, rotational grazing system is key for us. So, so we're, we're always making sure that we've got ground cover there, we're, we're, we're sowing the right pasture species, we're, we're making sure we apply the right amount of fertiliser, like little bits often is what we do. We don't ever over apply. We're very mindful that we don't want to leach you know, nitrogen or phosphorus into our, into our waterways. Um, we, we don't cultivate that soil that's not suitable for cultivation. That's only ever direct drilled. Um, so for us, pasture wise, and I suppose I should stick to pasture because that's my topic today. Uh, they're the big ones for us. Uh, you, using you know, the, the right sorts of chemicals, uh, only ever using, you know, label directions, um, never ever, yeah, veering from that. Like I say, we're quite happy. We use that biological control for, for the uh, caterpillar, the helicoverpa that was in our corn. Uh, that, that was a great example of, of um, you know, a very sustain. we're very mindful of the bees, you know. I'm sure you guys all know the importance of bees. Um, we, we certainly, uh, for, for pollination and everything like that, we, we certainly, um, uh, you know, wanted to do the best by them. Uh, so yeah, so all those sorts of things from our yeah, uh, pasture management practices right through to our paddock preparation practices and, and the chemicals we use, all that certainly adds to our sustainability. Ah, oh, yeah, effluent management. That's another one that you probably might, might touch on that tomorrow with the cattle, uh, effluent management. We, we capture all our effluent here on farm and then that's actually irrigated back through the centre pivots. So that's a little bit of a crossover between the, the cattle and the, and the, and the centre pivots. We, we can, through the entire 40 hectares, those pivots are poly-lined and, and the effluent then is not going to affect the, you know, the metal in the pivots and we can pump that effluent back over that 40 hectares. So we're actually building nutrients and, and soil carbon, soil organic matter back into our soil um, by u reusing that effluent. So it's an environmental benefit as well as production benefit for our system. Excellent. And I think Doug, Doug Gog High has a question. Did anyone want to ask it? Yeah, sure. Um, what biosecurity issues do you guys have in the management practices between staff and livestock? Yeah, so biosecurity is certainly something that we're, we're aware of uh, here on farm. Luckily enough, we've never had any real breaches or, or, or complications, but, but we've got a biosecurity plan in place. Um, everyone, people just can't wander onto the site willy nilly. Um, they, they've got to notify us that they're on site. Certainly if they'd been in an area, just an example would be Parramatta grass is, is around on a lot of farms. You guys are from Dungog, are you? You, you, you know about Parramatta grass up there. I suppose you've seen that, that grass growing in paddocks, that, that seed gets on vehicles it can spread, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, paddock to paddock quite easily. So people would, we've got wash bays here, so people would have to wash off their vehicles before, you know, venturing out into our, our farm, or, or we may even say, no, look, you, you park here and we'll take you in our vehicle out around the farm. So contractors certainly um, make sure they're, if they're on another farm before they come here, their uh, tractors and whatnot are uh, washed and cleaned off. Um, yeah, so that's that's certainly a, a big part of our, our biosecurity plan for sure. Matt, thank you so much once again for your time today. Um, I'd great. also like to thank the lovely schools who've joined in um, to be a part of this event. Um, and yeah, thank, thank you all so much for your time.